<laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, everyone at UW, Harborview watching uh, elsewhere. So I'll try and be brief, but it is a terrific pleasure to have Dr. Susan Perlman come to talk to us today. She's from UCLA. She's a professor of neurology, the head of their ataxia center, um, one of the heads of the neurogenetics clinic, director of their uh, Huntington's Disease Center of Excellence, and has had a long-standing, vigorous um, research program regarding clinical, longitudinal clinical trials, um, therapeutic clinical trials is a, is a real force in um, translational uh, neurology, translational neurological medicine. So uh, Dr. Perlman did some of her studies in New York and then since has uh, built her empire at UCLA and remains there. And uh, so she's here to talk to us. She gave a fantastic talk to the residents about pre -drikes, and now she's going to talk more generally about cerebellar syndromes. So uh, with that, thank you, Dr. Perlman. Susan, can you make sure that that gets on properly? Yeah. It's a little tricky and, uh, for some. <laughs> okay, for some with the taxi. Yeah, th thank you very much. I think the last time I was in Seattle was for a National Ataxia Foundation patient conference. This was a few years back, and all I really saw was the airport, the hotel, and the rain. Um, they had a ride a taxi fundraising event that, you know, kind of rode into the hotel in the pouring rain, you know, at the start of the conference. So that, that was my prior memory of Seattle. Today it was beautiful, you know, flying in, just gorgeous. Taxi, perfect, everything wonderful. Um, so hopefully it'll be as, as good going home to 90 well, degree weather. good for you. <laughs> All right. Um, so I wanted to, this is a real general topic that could go on for hours, um, update of the adult ataxia cerebellar syndromes, but um, on the way up on the plane, I deleted a lot of the genetic slides, figuring I didn't want to bring Coles to Newcastle because you are so strong here in medical and, and neurogenetics that I didn't want to risk putting up something that I would have eight hands in the air. That's not true, you know, that, that's you know, new now. Last year they changed that. So if there are any mistakes here on the genetic side, I, I fully apologize. It's all my fault because I'm, I'm really a clinician. I kind of backed into genetics um, having gotten involved with Friedreich's ataxia as a fellow. Um, back then it was biochemistry, it wasn't molecular genetics, and I could do biochemistry, I could you know, do spectrophotometers, I could do all that stuff. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, gosh, close to 20 years later that genetics began to overtake my rudimentary um, medical school knowledge. So now the people in my department who are, you know, the, the pillars of neurogenetics, you know, Dan Geschwind and, and Brent Fogel, you know, I'll never catch up to their level of knowledge. But I try to translate it for the patients. So a lot of the stuff you're going to hear is what my patients hear every time they come in, attempting to explain to them, to give them some perspective, and also to give them some hope for, you know, what we see in the pipeline now. Um, so I have some disclosures, but it's primarily um, clinical trials through big pharma or medium-sized pharma um, and some grants. Um, I'm going to talk about the phenotype of the adult ataxia patient, um, which in its simplest is, you know, somebody comes into your office complaining of trouble with balance and falling, and there are dozens of possibilities in, in that setting. So I'm going to go through, you know, the evolution of our thought process in, in our clinic. Um, when, you know, and when it's appropriate to do genetic testing, even in somebody who doesn't have a family history. And we just talked about how late onset Friedreichs you know, can present in an age group with no family history where you might not think of Friedreich's, but it's a cheap test to do. There's drugs in the pipeline. It's well worthwhile to, to do that in your adult ataxia patients. Um, and also to talk about possible treatment, symptomatic treatment, and then some of the things that are in the disease-modifying therapy pipeline. So this is our center, founded in the mid-70s as a research clinic for Friedreich's ataxia. But back then, ataxia was essentially unknown of any type. So when patients and families heard that there was a clinic that knew what ataxia meant, we began to see many, many other people with ataxic disorders, not just Friedreich's. We currently have a database of over 4,000 neurogenetics patients, most of them with ataxic disorders. You know, many of them were no longer following, they've passed away. Um, as, and we also have a DNA and biospecimen bank um, that we're using to, to help this you know, new generation of molecular genetic research. Um, we've evaluated over 500 patients in our HD Center of Excellence. We see about 100 new ataxia and HD patients every year and probably end up providing you know, continuity care for about half of them. 
Um, we do see asymptomatic individuals at risk in conjunction with our genetics group, which does most of the, in fact, it does all of the preclinical um, genetic counseling and genetic testing. Interestingly enough, it's based in pediatrics. So a lot of our adult at-risk patients are sitting there in the peds waiting room with all these little kids. Um, but that's where they've been based, and we've worked with them um, collaboratively for a number of years. We're a member of the Cooperative Ataxia Group, which has had many different names with different abbreviations, but I think the Cooperative Ataxia Group, CAG, is, is probably who we really are, um, and the Huntington Study Group. Um, we try to access multidisciplinary um, resources for our patients. You know, we do have physical therapy in clinic, we have psychology in clinic, we have social work in clinic, and we have a clinic without walls that we try to access other resources um, that we can't afford to pay um, out of our you know, small clinical income. We do a lot of community education in service training in nursing homes and are trying to get the word out about these rare disorders um, that are sometimes challenging to manage, certainly in the late stages. And you know, whatever help we can give the families and caregivers, you know, we, we attempt to do. So this was our demographic. We have a catchment area that includes all the way up the Pacific coast to Canada, down into Mexico, Pacific Rim. We have people coming in from you know, every place west of, of the Mississippi, um, which is why there's a huge need for more ataxia centers that can provide genetic testing and counseling, that can provide access to clinical trials, can provide guidance regarding symptomatic management, and just provide a, a listening ear for people who may think they're the only person in the world with ataxia. So you know, one of my missions is to see if we can organize some resources here so we can at least get a clinical trial center located that can you know, prevent people from British Columbia from having to travel over a thousand miles to come to UCLA. I think it's a crime to put that kind of a burden on people. So you know, the, any effort we can do to get more clinical trial centers, um, you know, this side of the Mississippi is, is going to be a benefit. And now's the time because the drugs are ready. Um, of the cases that we have seen, 40% of them either have Friedreich's or a known spinocerebellar ataxia. And I think that just reflects, you know, they, they come to us, they have a known diagnosis. There are probably a lot of unknowns who either have never been tested or don't have a genetic ataxia that, that we're not seeing. So those numbers may be a little skewed. Um, and that left 60% of them either with an unknown familial ataxia or uh, probably a non-genetic ataxia. And this is, um, I guess you can see it. Um, this was a survey I did of over 1,500 patients between 1995 and 2005 in our, our database, um, which I started on a you know, little computer in, in my office with a, an 89-year-old volunteer who wanted to do data entry for me. She occasionally lost files, but it was all right. The patients came back. We re-entered them. And we built up a database of over 1,500 patients. She retired in 2005, um, passed away a couple of years later. But um, you know, we analyzed that data to see how many had genetic, how many had unknown or non-genetic. Um, and you know, I think you can see that the the totals, um, you know, a little over 600 with you know what were felt to be genetic syndromes. 900 with either sporadic or you know potentially recessive or non-genetic syndromes. Um, the numbers now, and we're busy analyzing the next 10 years in our you know improved database, which actually has undergraduates doing data entry. Um, although Evelyn was wonderful, and and I really miss her. Um, I'm sure that our dominant numbers, our recessive numbers, are greater because we are seeing more and more of these patients, and a lot of these people who were defined especially the bottom group, really defined um, phenotypically. Ataxia with myoclonus, ataxia with neuropathy. With the advent of next generation um, you know, uh, exome sequencing genetic testing, um, I think a number of these will have been given very specific diagnoses now. And with more and more of them, you know, as the technology improves, certainly the ones where there's genetic factors un underlying it. Um, these are the studies we're currently involved in. We have a natural history study for Friedreich's that has been going on since 2002, um, and it's multi-center. There are about 12 sites around the country participating in this. Um, I see people from Seattle who come down once a year to participate in this study. There's a similar natural history study for the dominantly inherited ataxias. Um, SCA 1, 2, 3, and 6 probably going to expand to include um, 7 and 8. Um, currently unfunded, so you know everything we do is, is kind of voluntary data entry, but I think it's important to keep up 
were involved in the, the International Natural History Study for Huntington's Disease. Our biobank program has been involved in various collaborative activities, you know, using biological specimens. And my mission for the last couple of years was to become a clinical trialist, um, which was something I didn't know a whole lot about. We currently have five drug trials running or about to launch for free drive cetaxia. We have three drug trials that we're involved in for Huntington's disease and preparing additional drug trials for Joseph's disease and ataxia telangiectasia. And these are studies that we've already done initial paperwork, we've done the IRB submissions, we're working on contracts and, and getting ready to start recruiting. And this is all stuff that has kind of tumbled into our lap in the last two years. Um, so I think there is an avalanche of basic science now turning into clinically um, applicable um, you know, therapies, we hope. Comparative timelines. Um, going back to 1950, MDA was founded, National Ataxia Foundation was founded that decade, Honey's Disease Foundation was founded in the 60s, um, slowly drug trials, um, natural history studies, animal models, um, rating scales, you know, a, a lot of work has been going on over the last 50 years in trying to get a better foundation for dealing with these rare disorders. Um, the uh, totals at, in 2009 under spinal cerebellar ataxia, there had been two clinical drug trials. Um, Huntington's, there had been 16 trials, primarily antioxidants. And for Friedrichs, there had already been 19 trials. In the last six years, we're now up to, for spinal cerebellar ataxia, 26 clinical trials, you know, some open studies, some you know, small numbers of patients, some controlled trials, um, you know, some antioxidants, you know, and potentially, you know, enter, entering into drugs that may actually be disease modifying. For Friedreich's, 32 clinical drug trials of various sizes and, and validity have been done, and there are eight that are still operating. Um, as well as the natural history data, um, work on biomarkers, et cetera. So, you know, like I say, it's, it's been exponential. Um, the SCA pipeline, and I put this together, and this is stuff that's available on the internet. Um, it's, you know, on the websites. This is not privileged information. These are companies that have come forward and said, we have drugs in the pipeline that could be applied to spinal cerebellar ataxia. The most recent one was the Anavex company with a Sigma-1 receptor agonist. Um, that is felt to, you know, mediate cell stress in, in various ways. They completed a phase two for Alzheimer's and they're considering SCA2 or SCA3. Um, they came to the AAN, um, you know, a week or two ago, met with the taxi investigators that were there for our, our annual face-to-face -face meeting and already have a plan probably to move forward with SCA2. Um, AstraZeneca is working on, you know, a drug for, you know, microglial activation and, and neural inflammation, which is felt to be part of the pathophysiology of the genetic, certainly the dominantly inherited um, brain disorders like Huntington's disease and the SCAS, but they're going to be starting out with multiple system atrophy. Um, there are others also working on neuroinflammatory um, drugs. There are some open trials of IVIG, which, you know, kind of mild, um, probably won't be as effective as, as some of these designer agents. A company called Ataxion, working on CNS ion channel modulators to stabilize Purkinje cell electrical performance in the, in the dying Purkinje cell. They were in a pre-phase one, still arm wrestling with the FDA to be able to move forward. Um, Bioblast, working with intravenous trehalose, um, has a phase two study for SCOT3 that they've been um, doing in Europe, and they hope to begin one in Canada and the United States in the next couple of months. Um, it's felt to be a chaperone that prevents aggregate formation. Um, Isis Pharma, bad name, but they had it first, is working with antisense oligonucleotides. Um, they have one they've designed for Huntington's disease, and they hope to begin a trial in Huntington's um, to you know, really block the, the buildup of the protein aggregates um, by blocking the production of, of the abnormal protein. And they have definitely expressed an interest in SCOT7 and SCOT2. So I think we'll see that in the next couple of years. And this is, you know, definitely a disease-modifying therapy if, it, if it's effective. Um, this, this could be a huge step forward. And then Prana Biotech um, had a phase two study in Huntington's disease of, again, a chaperone molecule that, that supposedly um, broke up the, the protein aggregates. Um, but I don't know where they are going with that or if they're planning to move forward in, into the SCAS. Friedreich's ataxia, this exponential increase in clinical trials. 
um, tools that have made this possible. Um, disease mechanisms are better understood. Candidate drugs have been identified for every domino in the pathway from, you know, a, a CAG expansion to nerve cell death. There have been drugs that have been designed um, and looked at preclinically as being ways to perhaps interrupt that. There are natural history baselines going for, you know, over 10 years for some of these disorders to give us a sense of how quickly they progress and what we can expect with a good drug or a medium drug or a weak drug, how many patients we're going to have to involve in a clinical trial. And without the natural history data, we could never work with the companies to design clinical trials that will hopefully be statistically significant. Several rating scales have been developed um, and validated. Um, we have uh, NIH common data elements um, that have been standardized for Friedreich's ataxia research and will hopefully be standardized for some of the other ataxias. Biomarkers are being developed um, to help shorten um, or divert uh, you know, drugs that appear to be ineffective um, so we don't carry on for three years you know, involving 500 patients with a drug that's going to be prematurely terminated because it doesn't work. And this has happened. Um, patient registries are up and running to aid with patient recruitment. Um, there are clinical research centers established, but there's not enough of them. So we need more, and, and I think we should have a, a joint effort to work with the, the jungle of administration that all academic centers have to try to get a neurology clinical trials program going that's going to include the ataxias. Um, and we have an operational database. Um, the, the hardware is at UCLA. It's open, free of charge for anybody who wants to use it for our currently unfunded you know, SCA natural history study to bank your own data. If you're collecting data, you can have a little corner of the database reserved for you, private, firewalled off from the rest of us. So it is a resource that you won't have to develop yourself. Um, and you know, I can you know, make the contact person's um, email address available to you if you want to discuss this with her. Um, future directions telemedicine we were talking about earlier, um, electronic monitoring um, so that the patients don't have to come back and forth to clinics as often. We can monitor things from a distance. And then international collaborations are already involved in most of these drug trials. These are international companies and they're going to have international sites. However, you know, we always have to be careful. Um, we have to counsel our patients wisely. Um, we don't want them running off to China for stem cells. Um, although um, in Taiwan, they are developing a stem cell project for multiple system atrophy and for SCOT3, which I think is going to be, um, you know, probably getting FDA approval to have sites in the United States. So, you know, even things that, you know, are snake oil, you know, at some point are either going to be taken off the pipeline or will become validated. Um, and, you know, our patients are, are more aware of this than we are. And they bring me articles. They confess that they... They went to Guatemala for stem cells in the middle of another trial, and is that a problem? You know, it's, you know, it's, they're, they're aggressive, creative people and families, and we need to support that. So this is the Cooperative Ataxia Group. Um, I had a different layout before, but then I realized the National Ataxia Foundation has a website where they list ataxia centers, and they list docs who are comfortable dealing with ataxia. And the University of Washington is in the docs comfortable dealing with ataxia as opposed to the ataxia center column. And, and I think I would like to change that because this is a growing and important area for neurogenetics for sure. Um, over here you can see that there are ataxia centers who are then going to be candidates for clinical trials because, you know, big pharma comes looking to see who's got, you know, the patients and who has the infrastructure. Alabama, you know, two or three places in California, Colorado, a peds neuro person is actually seeing adult ataxia patients. Um, Florida has a couple of centers, Illinois, Maryland, um, you know, there's some gaps in the country, um, you know, kind of the, you know, the Great Plains, there aren't any centers there, and I don't know if it's because it's, you know, tornado belt, um, but, uh, you know, I think we do need to make ourselves more accessible. Um, concerns from the recent meeting of the cooperative ataxia group looking over everything that we have done and the avalanche of new research, um, especially drug trials, feel that we need a better and more cost-effective algorithm for evaluating idiopathic late-onset cerebellar ataxia, um, let alone the $17,000 of genetic testing, which is, is probably inappropriate. But, you know, many, many tests for acquired causes, is there any way to, you know, systematize them or come up with some kind of a flow chart 
So you don't send somebody to the lab to, to give up 20 vials of blood for things that we've never found a change in. You know, I'm working off lists that I've been working off for a long time, but you know, I, I think people with Lyme disease are just getting filtered out before they ever get to my clinic. So, um, you know, I think they, they all agreed we need a better way to standardize the assessment of people over the age of 40 with new onset cerebellar ataxia and also more standardized use of the next generation sequencing, you know, whole exome sequencing, um, which is, you know, again, in the last couple of years has really grown um, into a commercial enterprise. Um, they, they want more cooperative ataxia group members. Um, you know, for a while, the, the only people who showed up at these meetings were the same 10 people that had been showing up for 10 years. The meeting, though, two weeks ago, there were, you know, a dozen new faces from some of those, those new centers. Um, collaboration with the Multiple System Atrophy Global Task Force, which was founded um, or launched last fall uh, with a grant from an MSA, a wealthy MSA patient in Las Vegas working through the Cleveland Clinic. So this is an attempt to pull together all the disparate small groups working with MSA on exactly the same questions, natural history, better diagnosis, um, better biomarkers, and clinical trials. Um, rather than you know, us becoming one more small group, we feel we should really join forces with them. And then better collaboration with industry. You know, they need to recognize that we have a cooperative ataxia group that has a lot of patients. These are the things that the patients themselves are concerned about. Um, how long it takes to be diagnosed, how many pa physicians are just not familiar with ataxia, um, and how little those neurologists have to offer them, you know, after they make the diagnosis. Um, hopelessness from the neurologist viewpoint, which definitely spills over to the family. And, you know, I'm often, you know, asked by patients, am I just supposed to lie down and die? Um, because they really feel that, you know, that, not, that they're stuck. Um, with networking with the National Ataxia Foundation, you know, the chat rooms, the website, the conferences, the support groups, educating their neurologists, um, getting them in touch with other ataxia patients, we can relieve a lot of this distress. Um, so, you know, I think most of these questions we now have the ability to answer. Um, with better genetic technologies, we can address, you know, are my children at risk? Um, we can address research for a very specific, a growing number of very specific diseases. Um, as a neurologist, though, you're seeing a patient for the first time. Why does this person have the balance problem? Am I going to order genetic testing and, and how much of an investment should I force the patient to, or his insurance company to make? Um, is there a cure? And then unfortunately, most, most of the time the answer to that is no. Um, but how I can improve their quality of life, there are many, many things that we can do. Um, the referrals that we get, you know, sometimes the patient asking for a second opinion or the referring doctor asking for a second opinion or has a question about ordering genetic testing. We see people where the obvious next step would be to order a genetic test, but sometimes the community physician just doesn't know what to order. Um, there's not enough standard of care regarding use of genetic testing. And this is where, you know, neurogenetics here, you know, which forged the field for, for many years, you know, is hopefully going to, you know, lead, you know, in establishing those, those criteria. Um, and then, you know, making research available to them and, and other resources. So this is your typical patient with imbalance. Um, 50 years old, plus or minus 20 years, male or female, two-year history of walking difficulty and falling. And, you know, maybe you're the first neurologist they're seeing. Maybe they've seen a couple of other doctors who wrote it off to something else um, or gave them an answer they didn't like. Um, they may be using an assistive device. Um, they may have other associated symptoms of greater or lesser importance, numbness or weakness or tremor, um, but usually it's the balance that brings them in. Um, they may have various past or current medical issues. Um, they may smoke, they may drink, they may have some possible toxic exposures, they may have spent, you know, most of their life traveling back and forth to China. Um, you know, there's a lot of environmental things that, that you'll want to know about. Um, and there may, there's usually no known family history of balance problems. Um, so you have to decide, is this ataxia? Um, and so I have been categorizing my patients phenotypically for years. You know, obviously if I get a genetic diagnosis, it moves over to a genotype, but I still have a number of patients who have cerebellar ataxia with spasticity, cerebellar ataxia with myoclonus. Um, and until we find the key that's going to unlock the specific diagnosis, at least I can find them. Um, and it was, you know, atypical Friedreichs. You know, I had 12 people with that diagnosis. 
And then when um, testing came out for late onset Tay-Sachs, lo and behold, that's what they had. And I was only able to find them and bring them in for testing because I had categorized them in a way that jumped right out at me. Um, National Itaxia Registry, um, now being supported by the Sanford Research Group for their rare disease registry. Um, patients and families can self-register, hopefully with a known diagnosis or a diagnosis that makes sense so that researchers can contact them, not directly, but can make um, flyers available to them, mailers available to them about research that may be important to them. Friedreich's Ataxia has a similar registry based um, in the Friedreich's Ataxia Research Alliance um, where you know, people can be notified via email or other communication about a clinical trial that might be appropriate for them. So I think getting people into the registry, even if they have an unknown ataxia, that's a category, ataxia unknown, um, so that they can at least feel that they're in the loop and, and you know, researchers who may have good ideas can have access to them. Phenotypes, is it cerebellar? Is it spinocerebellar affecting spinal long tracts? Um, are there you know, cerebrocortical or subcortical involvements, some out of sensory ataxia, and non-ataxic disorders that can affect balance? Um, you know, and walking, you know, muscle weakness, basal ganglia symptoms, vestibular symptoms, and visual problems. In the older patient over the age of 70, much less likely to be genetic, much more likely to be multifactorial. And you just define each factor and tackle it in, in the best symptomatic way that you can. Um, sometimes there may be other associated neurologic features that can help you categorize a patient. Um, you know, they have autonomic changes, they have dementia. Um, or there may be associated non-neurologic features that can also um, help focus you on, well, they have heart disease and ataxia, I better rule out mitochondrial disease. Um, they have skin changes, you know, think of the phacomatoses um, and, you know, inborn errors that may, may cause changes in the skin. Um, and certainly, you know, these recessively inherited, you know, inborn errors of metabolism for the most part can occur in adults. Um, so we shouldn't take them off the list. The tempo of the ataxia can sometimes help you in making a diagnosis. You know, something that, you know, occurs rapidly, tra trauma, vascular changes, metabolic toxic changes, infection are high on your list. Subacute things you might think um, autoimmune, inflammatory, um, perineoplastic, um, and more slowly progressive, you begin to think more about genetic causes. Um, episodic, you know, there's a, a group of disorders that are, are classically episodic, and then static things. You know, the kid has always been incoordinated, um, it hasn't gotten worse, and, and as he's gotten older, it's gotten better. Um, is it a congenital problem that's, that's going to remain stable until they hit the magic age of 40 and start aging? So this was kind of our basic workup. Um, I think common things that most patients had had done before they came to us um, ruling out other medical issues, you know, common, you know, immune-mediated and perineoplastic antibodies. Um, but then the question is, genetic testing. Um, should you do it? Um, are you going to find something treatable? Not yet. But um, certainly it can aid in, in prognosticating, in, um, you know, counseling the family. So inheritance, you know, and I'm not even going to talk to you guys about inheritance. Um, you know, possible, you know, inheritance, you know, this could be, you know, anything. It could be dominant, it could be recessive with a lot of inbreeding, it, it could be X-linked, it, it could be mitochondrial. Um, so sometimes the, the pedigree will help you, and sometimes it, it may not give you any clues as to what type of gene. So you'll just go ahead and check one box in the Athena, you know, registry. You'll order $19,000 worth of tests, which are, are probably, for the most part, inappropriate. Um, these are the basic inherited ataxia phenotypes. Um, slowly progressive, relatively symmetrical, may present with or without a family history. The dominant, um, autosomal dominant cerebellar ataxias or SCAs, which are numbered, I think they're up to like 40 now or 41. The Friedreich's ataxia-like syndromes, primary Friedreich's, but things that look like Friedreich's. Early onset cerebellar ataxia with retained reflexes, same age group as the Friedreich's-like syndromes, with the exception that they have cerebellar atrophy as opposed to spinal cord atrophy and they have retained reflexes. Mitochondrial syndromes, multiple system atrophy picture, predominantly purely cerebellar syndromes, and then the hereditary spastic paraplegias, which may include features of ataxia. And you should be able to put your patient into at least one of these categories, even if you don't know what the gene is. You know, their father had it, their grandmother had it, 
Um, they've got it. It's you know cerebellar predominantly, maybe with a little brainstem involvement. So they would go in the first category until you found the actual genetic factor. And the same goes for the other the other categories. Um, Anita Harding had her classification: um, ADCA, autosomal dominant cerebellar ataxia type one through seven. Now, with the availability of genetic testing, we've been able to sort through those that have a typical dominant ataxia into the specific SCAs that, you know, uh, that, that seem to fall into that group. There's only one identified SCA that is with retinal degeneration, ADCA2, that's SCA7. Um, pure cerebellar, there are some SCAs that are pure cerebellar and really never um, you know, have the manifestations outside the cerebellum. Um, ADCA4 with myoclonus and deafness. You know, there are, you know, several categories that, that we could look at there. With tremor, there are SCAs that have prominent tremor, um, episodic features, and then with dementia, SCA17, FAXTAS, and the prion diseases. So the molecular genetic revolution has helped us build on what was previously a, a pretty good phenotypic categorization. Um, this is just some detail about the SCAs. Um, Friedreich's ataxia is about, you know, 2 in 100,000. All of the SCAs together are about five in a hundred thousand, so they're they're all fairly rare. The SCAs, the spinal cerebellar ataxias, um, you know, typical age of onset in their twenties or thirties. Um, different types of mutations. There are CAG repeats, coding and non-coding. There are other repeats, um, CTG repeats for SCA8, uh, pent uh, pentapeptide repeats um, for SCA10, and then point mutations. And, you know, it's like every time a new technology was found, when we discovered triplet repeats with Huntington's disease, all of a sudden everybody was screening for new triplet repeats. A, a whole, you know, a, a large number of the early SCA genes that were found were because of this um, triplet repeat discovery technology. It kind of ran out after a while, and now we're using newer generation technology to look for point mutations and other mutations. Um, I think one thing we still don't understand in, in the um, poly-Q disorders is why um, an expansion that's abnormal in SCA7 um, does not cause problems in, you know, some of the other SCAs. Um, an expansion that is, you know, normal for essentially all of them is abnormal for SCA6. Um, so there's still a lot that we don't know about the pathophysiology on, on a molecular basis here. Um, it may have a lot to do with other proteins that are interacting with, you know, the nerve cells that are in those, those areas that are affected. Um, all the SCAs um, have gait ataxia and speech problems. Most common are SCA 3, 6, 2, and 1 in that order in North America, and they account for over 50%. So if you have a dominant family, you order those four tests, and you have a better than 50% chance of finding the cause. Um, clinical clues, um, and this you can, you know, get off the um, neuromuscular homepage, you know, where, you know, each of the SCAs, although they pretty much look alike, if you see somebody who's been balance challenged for a couple of years and they have slowed saccades, more likely it's going to turn out to be SCA2. If you see somebody with retinal degeneration, more likely it's going to be SCA7. Um, and then other associated features as well. This is the um, cooperative ataxia group otherwise known as CRC-SCA, um, natural history study. Um, enrollment, you know, up to about a year ago, we had 393 um, dominant ataxia patients from all these contributing sites. Um, the bulk of them, you know, 145 were SCA3, um, you know, fewer of SCA2 and SCA6, um, and then the smaller number was SCA1. Um, you know, enrollment was going well, um, still enrolling, so that the last data count um, in this past December, um, you know, more in each category and, you know, over 400 now overall. The Europeans have a similar natural history database that they've been accumulating for, you know, probably twice as long as we have. Um, Friedreich's ataxia-like syndromes, um, basically spinal cerebellar as opposed to cerebellar with all of the, the classic symptoms of Friedreich's. Um, Friedreich's phenocopies, late onset Tay-Sachs, vitamin E associated syndromes. Um, carrier frequency is relatively high. One in 60 to 100 individuals is going to be a carrier of a mutant gene for Friedreich's. Um, relatively rare in Asian and Sub-Saharan African populations because their normal GAA repeat in that first intron is like seven. 
much less likely to expand than somebody from northern, you know, northern European who may have a normal allele with 35 GAAs, which is mildly unstable and could easily expand into the symptomatic range. Um, so, you know, this is something that, that, you know, the genetic testing has allowed us to uncover. 10% of people with Friedreichs have onset over at the age of 25. Um, they have retained reflexes, they have cerebellar atrophy, easily confused with the other SCAs. 3% um, will have a point mutation on one allele and an expansion on the other. There is about 10% from a survey we did of people who look like they have Friedreichs but are gene negative. So there are probably other genes in other pathways affecting mitochondrial function with the same end result. Um, variable phenotypes um, outside of the classic um, Harding phenotype, the late onset, retained reflexes, more slowly progressive disease, demyelinating as opposed to axonal neuropathy, a pure sensory ataxia with no apparent spinal cerebellar involvement, late onset spastic ataxia with no posterior column sensory changes. Two brothers were reported with chorea and no ataxia who had, you know, Friedreich's ataxia on a genetic basis. Um, and those who are carriers, you know, the parents who are obligate carriers, don't seem to have a higher risk for diabetes, which is a risk for patients with Friedreichs. Um, in three studies, they just couldn't find anything in the carrier state that was challenged at all, that you can live with 50% for tax and protein without a problem. Um, this is just, you know, some details about, you know, the gene itself. It's required, the protein that it makes is required for the assembly of iron sulfur clusters which are involved in aconitase and complexes one through three in the electron transport chain. So a frataxin protein deficiency results in free iron floating around, increased oxidative stress, and decreased energy production. So it's really an internal energy crisis um, that disables the mitochondrion and ultimately disables the, the neural structures. Um, phenocopies we've already alluded to. Mitochondrial syndromes, the large umbrella group to which Friedreichs technically belongs that, um, you know, these are all the distinctive neurologic features and non-neurologic features that are reported in disorders with mitochondrial dysfunction. So if you see somebody with ataxia, dementia, and diabetes, okay, they could have alcohol-related ataxia, diabetes, and, you know, small vessel disease, or they could have a mitochondrial disorder. So it's worthwhile looking at this, you know, kind of um, buffet of choices and when you see, you know, several neurologic and non-neurologic features coming together in a patient, you should think mitochondrial. Um, early onset cerebellar ataxia with retained reflexes. This is the flip so side of the Friedreich's coin. Um, easily distinguished, you know, by MRI criteria um, and has several distinctive syndrome syndromes which are, are pretty easy to recognize. Um, this was a nice um, kind of flow chart put together by Dr. Fogel for an article about the autosomal recessive ataxias, you know, how to stage um, a workup, you know, you know where, where the forks in the road are, when to order certain testing, um, and hopefully at the, when you get to the bottom, you'll have, you know, for the majority of these people, um, certainly with the addition of exome sequencing, uh, a genetic explanation for their disorder. Um, so how do you justify genetic testing to your HMO? Um, there's one feature that really suggests that it's this disease and we need to find out for genetic counseling for the family. Um, you know, I know this doesn't look like Friedreich's, but, you know, there are treatments now. Um, there's enough, you know, in this person that we should definitely rule this in or out. Um, you know, we have a good hit rate. Fifty percent of the patients, we do genetic testing. We get a diagnosis. This is very appealing. Um, two to five percent of people without a family history will end up with a genetic diagnosis. Um, the family is very worried and will sometimes be calling an insurance company even as you are. Um, you know, there are certainly, um, you know, a lot of things you can do to try to get coverage for genetic testing. And I think with the, the increase in clinical um, use of next generation sequencing, um, which is, you know, between $3,000 to $5,000, still cheaper than the full Athena panel. But, you know, it's going to take the insurance companies a little while to, to get used to that. I've been fortunate that I really haven't had anybody where, where funding has been refused. No family history. I think we all know the, the multiple pitfalls that may, may cause us to be unaware of, of the family. Um, but potentially it really is non-genetic. Um, so, you know, if you have to go fishing, you know, without a family history, 
for an adult onset ataxia, you know, if you're looking for SCAs, one, two, three, six, and then eight, maybe. Um, late onset sporadic ataxia, for sure, SCA six, fragile X, and Friedreich's ataxia, very reasonable to check. Um, and that's why we rely so heavily on our genetic counselors who, who are really the experts in this area. The complete Athena ataxia panel, 23 tests, you know, upwards of $20,000. They do have this new um, promise that they're going to keep the copay to less than $500, but sometimes that cost falls back on the ordering institution, which then has to absorb it and may not be eager to do that. Um, so it may, it may look appealing to the patient, well, I only have to pay $495 and get all these tests, but somebody else is going to end up paying that amount. Um, they have a number of repeat expansions, a number of point mutations, and small deletions you know, for the known ataxic disorders. Um, and now, I was going to the Athena website to make sure I had all the tests listed, new and improved with exome sequencing. They just put this up. Um, they have a, a new team of highly trained scientists who are going to be looking at the pathogenicity of genetic variants and looking at exome sequencing powered by, you know, cutting edge technology, you know, with phenotype and, you know, all the statistical calculations is this, you know, variant of unsung significance in an important part of the gene where it could be affecting the activity of the gene, um, includes medically interpretable regions outside the exome, introns, um, untranslated regions, and promoters. Now this is already edging into whole genome sequencing. So if it's really true, it looks like Athena is attempting to commercialize whole genome sequencing, because um, I know our group that does whole exome isn't even looking at genome yet. And how you would interpret this, I don't know. Um, but I, I think this shows how far we've come with the new molecular genetic technology um, that's available. They say that you know, with some of their um, internal study, they can find causative mutations in about 56% of the patients that have it done, um, compared to 25% with other technologies. Um, work that we've done at UCLA that was presented by Dr. Fogel um, in a publication and also at, at the neurology meetings um, looked at 76 patients um, with chronic progressive cerebellar ataxia, um, you know, without, you know, with or without family history. We sent exome sequencing to our commercial lab. Um, he attended all the meetings. You know, there was comprehensive bioinformatic analysis, phenotype analysis, clinical correlation, um, and he was finding relevant genetic information in over 60% of the patients studied, but. Um, diagnostic pathogenic genes in, in only about a fifth of them. So his number is a little less than what Athena is promoting. So it just remains to be seen, you know, how, how we can make best use of this very powerful technology. The most common ones that have been coming up are SYN1, which is uh, the gene involved uh, in um, spinal cerebellar ataxia recessive type 8. Um, previously, the only commercial testing for this gene was being done in Portugal. So now you can order exome sequencing and you can screen for it. Um, like I say, it's come up in maybe half a dozen patients that, that we have sent through. And also SPG7, um, which is you know, one of the spastic paraplegias that has ataxic features. So we have patients with you know, late onset, you know, no family history, ataxia with upper motor neuron features. And you know, three or four of them have turned out to be positive for SPG7. So, you know, I think it is definitely improving our ability to move people from the phenotypic side to the genotypic side. Um, idiopathic late onset cerebellar ataxia, um, previously known as OPCA. Um, I think most people look at OPCA and idiopathic late onset cerebellar ataxia as way stations on the road to a more specific diagnosis. That was the general agreement in the cooperative ataxia group meeting that we had, um, that these aren't really diagnoses, they're tags that you can use. Um, Harding classified these as well, type A with dementia, type B with tremor, type C sporadic OPCA, which includes the multiple system atrophy group and other Parkinson's plus syndromes. Um, so, you know, I think you know, we have again been able to better understand her, her very good classification um, Klotgether in the, in the German slash European group, you know, which has been very aggressive in working with genetic and non-genetic ataxias, um, you know, set out a classification and some diagnostic criteria for the sporadic ataxias. But, you know, there are really no clues, um, you know, in the epidemiology. 
there's you know very little that sets you know any of these subgroups in this group apart. Possibly um, you know some exposure to solvents or pesticides in in a subgroup of them. Um, regarding multiple system atrophy, there's a group of families in Japan that seem to have a problem in the um, production of coenzyme Q10. There's a block at the at the CoQ2 level that seems to result in a familial expression of multiple system atrophy. But you know, again, it's it's still really a very large undefined group, um, and the approach is the same. You know, phenotype it as best you can. You know, get as detailed a family and environmental history as you can. Rule out known acquired causes. Consider the genetic testing. Um, this is another kind of flow sheet algorithm that Dr. Fogel put together for the late onset cerebellar ataxias. It really doesn't have more detail than, than what we've already discussed. This is his ataxia evaluation worksheet. Started with one of the movement disorders fellows, you know, several years ago. He built on it. Um, including what he felt were good first-line tests, second-line tests, and then you know third-line tests or, or comments about things that might help you sort people out. You know things every ataxia patient should have done. If you're thinking about genetic testing, you know the things you would consider. Um, you know heavy metals. You know multiple sclerosis, perineoplastic disorders. Um, and now you know I think you know this came out in. I think he first published it in 2006, so a lot of patients are coming to me having already had a lot of this done. Um, the late onset inborn errors occur over here in third line. Um, I must admit I haven't found one in a long time. Um, I think they're getting filtered out before they come to my clinic. So the fork in the road for this group, who is going to evolve into multiple system atrophy? 80% of MSAs start out with Parkinsonism, 20% start out with cerebellar ataxia, and for many years the Parkinson's MSAs were being seen in movement disorders and the ataxic MSAs were being seen in my clinic and we finally got together and are seeing all of them together on Monday afternoons anticipating clinical trials so let's make it easy for for all of us 25 percent of sporadic ataxia patients will develop into MSA um, usually within five years so you know there are some clues you know the presence of early erectile dysfunction REM sleep disturbances early bladder dysfunction can maybe give you a clue I think also um, hot cross bun sign, although it's seen in Parkinson's, in Scott 2, um, in some other diseases, I think it is most characteristically seen earlier in people that are going to develop all the clinical features of multiple system atrophy. Um, not a likely diagnosis in people onset after 75. Um, if there's a family history of something, you know, because at least in North America and Europe, MSA is not genetic, um, if they have a classic pill rolling rest tremor, if they have chorea, if they have ophthalmoplegia or dementia, makes MSA much less likely of a diagnosis. So that chart I'm not going to belabor. I think we all know the pathophysiology of MSA. Um, ataxia patient management. Um, do your best to find out what they have. Go to bat for them. Offer treatment for symptoms that is going to improve their quality of life and make research available to them. Bad prognostic signs. Um, important to have some idea for the purpose of the family and caregivers what's a bad sign. Untreatable rigidity, autonomic failure, bulbar symptoms, um, obstructive apnea, stride or choking can lead to death in under a year, and certainly in the MSA population. Um, increased falling, injuries, um, becoming bed bound, you know, decubit eye infections. You know, if they're falling, if they're becoming bedbound, um, you can anticipate many more complications. Um, dementia, behavioral problems, depression can make management a lot more difficult. If you work with these symptoms, it can make management a lot easier for the family and caregivers. And pain is treatable. Falls, the Euroska um, fall study found that people more, were more likely to fall when they had other symptoms besides just the ataxia. They had upper motor neuron symptoms, um, basal ganglia symptoms, um, complicating their imbalance that made them less able to, to kind of catch themselves. Drugs for ataxia. If you typed in treatment ataxia, all of these drugs would come up with at least one you know, case report, one or two small studies, a couple of control studies, um, amantadine, Buspar, L5-hydroxytryptophan, memantine, Physostigmine, um, Tandospirone, which I don't think is available in the U.S., thyrotropin releasing factor, 
which is, you know, again, not really available in the U.S. Shantix, um, there's a published study of its use in SCA3. Um, so that there are definitely many medications, all of them off-label, all of them could be tried if you had somebody with severe tremor or myoclonus or nystagmus um, to improve their symptoms. Fatigue is a complication for just about every ataxia patient I've ever met. There are lots of medicines you can try for fatigue. Uh, a lot of people seem to feel antioxidant vitamins help their energy levels or B12 shots. Um, I usually counsel them, try it for six months. If it helps, fine. If it doesn't help, change it up. Non-drug approaches also can help with fatigue. Um, you know, certainly there could be other illness. They could be having side effects. I just got a, a text message today, you know, uh, when I was getting off the plane from one of my patients who probably has a perineoplastic cerebellar problem, treated the cancer, but he hasn't really gotten better, hasn't gotten worse, still on IVIG. And apparently he shared with um, one of the clinic staff that he was profoundly fatigued. Didn't mention it at all um, in, in our clinic visit. So I, I now I must put on my thinking cap and try to figure out what I can do to help that. But good nutrition, conditioning exercise, pain control, emotional health can all be very beneficial um, in helping to counteract fatigue and improve quality of life. Rehab, all the rehabilitation specialties um, should be brought to bear. Um, to help people, you know, cope with and improve their day-to-day -day performance. Physical and occupational therapy, um, everybody should be on some kind of a good home exercise program mm -hmm. within what they can tolerate. Um, it should include some type of aerobic or conditioning, some rhythmic repetitive exercise and core strengthening to help with balance. Um, and there have been several studies done in Europe, you know, looking at intensive physical training and the ability to turn the clock back two years on the natural history spectrum for some of these patients. So basically the bottom line is exercise always helps ataxia. Symptomatic drugs, it's your choice if you want to put somebody at risk for side effects of amantadine. Usually if a patient is reaching the point where they're going to be going from a, a walker to a wheelchair, I'll give them an opportunity to try something to prevent that um, as well as a booster of physical therapy. What do you try first? Amantadine. Um, unless there's a contraindication, usually, you know, severe constipation, you know, probably wouldn't try amantadine right off the bat. Um, I put two of my Friedrichs ataxia males into urinary retention with amantadine, so you have to be a little careful. Um, but I think it's the one that I've had the most success with. I've got a lot of sporadic ataxias who feel great on Boost Bar. Um, I've got a few people on 4-aminopyridine, um, and we had a nice discussion about that. Um, Shantix I don't use because, you know, it has too many side effects and can make tremor worse. So, you know, I think you have, you know, for tremor itself, there's, you know, the whole list of tremor drugs that movement disorders people work, and I have patients who have tried every one of them. So I think it's important to work with them, you know, within what they're able to accept and tolerate. Helpful websites. The Stanford Hopes website is really directed more towards Huntington's, but it has a terrific list of drugs, supplements, and clinical trials for Huntington's that may have some application for the SCAs. So when I'm looking at what might be next for spinal cerebellar ataxia, this is a tremendous website. Um, I learn a lot from it, you know, as well as all the other websites that I think we all know about. These are the people we work with at UCLA. Um, you know, a group that we've built up over the years. Everybody contributes. If, you know, we're offered a clinical trial and I need cooperation from neuroimaging, I know who to go to. Um, so, you know, I'm grateful for, for everybody that has participated in this. Um, and, you know, certainly for the patients and families and organizations that have supported our work, you know, even families where we misdiagnosed them for five years until we finally figured out what they had, they still are supporting our research. So, a few questions. Okay. And anybody in the audience? We have a, okay, yes. Uh, so, um, that was a very nice overview. So I see a lot of patients with Lou Gehrig's disease, and I know that a subset of the scars, the ones that are SCA3, because they can have some anterior worm cell involvement. Are there other ones that I should be vigilant about and not mistake for motor neuron disease, because they have a little bit of involvement with anterior worm cell? I think the, um, well, all the spastic paraplegias, the complicated spastic paraplegias, you know, the, the question of is this ALS comes up, and usually the tempo of the disease will will allay your fears there. Although I just got an email from a woman whose husband has been diagnosed with ALS and 
the story isn't one hundred percent perfect, and you know they they want a second opinion. Um, but you know there are very specific diagnostic criteria for ALS, um, and I don't know what the percentage of atypical cases are that eventually evolve into the full blown syndrome. Do you have any idea what percentage that might be? I guess it depends on, on how you define atypical. So, you know, we're learning more and more about atypical features of ALS of autonomic syndromes, sensory symptoms. But I tend to think of ataxia as being very atypical. So, so I, it would make me think about something else. Yeah. I mean, there's no reason why somebody who has an ataxic disorder couldn't also develop ALS. Um, just, you know, lightning striking twice, unfortunately, it, it can happen. Um, other questions from the audience? There's one question that was typed in. Um, what are your thoughts on Raluzol? The British, uh, and actually I think it was the, the Germans, had a study of Raluzol as a symptomatic treatment for ataxia. I think they initially were using it as a neuroprotective agent and found that within eight weeks, balance seemed to be improved in some of the patients with genetic and non-genetic adult onset ataxia. Um, I've used it in some patients, um, not neuroprotectively, but just symptomatically. I think getting it paid for is the most difficult hurdle because it's expensive and approved only for ALS. Um, but like I say, I've got patients who have tried everything on the list. Um, I think it's probably never going to have a large study done, funded by the drug company for, you know, repurposing it as an indication for ataxia. I think it's, you know, financially it's not a benefit, but it's there on your list of potentially symptomatic things you can offer them. Yes? One of the things you mentioned was that just a general workup in the LC, do you do that typically, and what are you looking for besides just inflammation? If I have somebody with a subacute or more rapidly progressive syndrome, I'm looking usually for inflammatory or autoimmune factors. Um, that may show up in, in, you know, a blood test, but, you know, typically you're going to look like GAD antibodies in spinal fluid. Um, I, you know, if I suspect that, like I do with one patient now, that he might have a CNS lymphoma, which is not showing up on imaging, you know, you, you would do a spinal tap and look at cytology, but, but sometimes those, those are very successful in hiding. Um, so it's not the first thing that I do, although 30 years ago it was one of the first things that you did. Um, but I think there still is a role if you're trying to nail down not a genetic mechanism, but you know one of the acquired mechanisms. Um, yes, a, a couple of questions. So one, uh, uh, if you see a patient that clearly has a cerebellar ataxia, uh, and uh, would you expect that you would be able to see some cerebellar atrophy uh, if it was more or less a cerebellar syndrome? If, let's say, I have somebody with ataxia who comes with their MRI scan. They're still walking, and they have a moderate amount of, a, of atrophy on their MRI scan. That usually would tell me they've got probably a genetic cause that has been slowly wearing away their cerebellum, but they've been able to compensate over years until ultimately they run out of reserve. On the other hand, if I see somebody with severe ataxia and essentially no or minimal atrophy, makes me think of some of the more um, rapidly progressive acquired causes, immune-mediated, where the atrophy may lag. Um, but, um, you know, you can have ataxia on a, on a spinal cord basis, so the brain can look good, like in Friedreich's, but the, the cord itself may be atrophied. Um, so I think the MRI is a tool, um, but it, it may not give you all your answers. You mentioned biomarkers. Uh, is there a biomarker that you think uh, I can tip the scale in your thinking in terms of diagnosis or management? Uh, I wasn't aware of any. Biomarkers are mainly for research. Um, if you're looking at Friedreich's ataxia with a potential disease-modifying therapy, can you measure free radicals in blood or urine? And is it an effective biomarker for a drug that you hope is controlling free radicals in the brain? So far, no. You know, those biomarkers have not worked out. For taxin protein levels measured in a cheek swab may be a good biomarker for the protaxin protein boosting drugs. And they're still looking for you know, biomarkers, MR spectroscopy patterns that may correlate with certain types of ataxia or may correlate with certain um, neuronal stress patterns that could be reversed with you know, a good therapy. So these are the kinds of things that you would expect to see improved in six weeks as opposed to six months of a drug trial.
and might, you know, if it's a reliable biomarker, you can stop the trial then or continue it because it looks like it's going to support, you know, a positive clinical outcome. Yes. We just for feedback about genetic testing, we've had a serious problem with trying to get it paid for. We've had insurance companies turn it down. We have a lot of patients that are either on Medicare or Medicaid, uh, and we get nowhere with those systems. So I would say at least half the time we haven't been able to get genetic testing funded. And it sounds like you haven't had that kind of problem. You know, when I attend at like one of our county hospitals, you know, like Harbor General, they absolutely cannot order genetic testing. Their lab will not let them order it because the reimbursement is not reliable. I have never had a problem. I haven't had a problem in five years with a patient getting a bill for $20,000 for genetic testing that wasn't paid for. So I'm not quite sure what our lab is doing. Um, to, you know, convince insurance companies. I mean, with the whole changing insurance climate now, this may itself change. Um, but I haven't had any problems because if I did, you know, the, I, I, okay, I've had two people in the last two years where the test wasn't run because it wasn't authorized. And that's just two. And I send a lot of genetic testing. What, what I like that I think is happening is the American Academy of Neurology comes out with guidelines, and they just came out with a guideline for congenital muscular dystrophies. And right up at the top is genetic testing. So now you can go to the insurance company and you can say, this is standard of care. Yes. And I think if we can get that into the, uh, into the uh, literature and into the standard of care kind of mechanisms, uh, that'll force the insurance companies to, uh, to pay attention. I think one thing that's going to help just regarding cost is, is the use of next generation sequencing where you can check for every single point mutation and variant of unknown significance in every gene whether or not you know its function for a quarter the cost of checking one box on the Athena panel. Um, and I think the cost difference is, is going to be a bargaining chip as well with, with insurers. One thing that's going to make getting uh, genetic testing a lot easier is when some subtypes of uh, genetic uh, cerebellar ataxia are truly treated, uh, can be modified by uh, some sort of an agent. Uh, at that point, uh, then the cards are good for us. In fact, once there's a, an approved therapy for Friedreich's, it's already in motion to include Friedreich's genetic testing on the heel stick for newborns. Um, it's all ready to go. We just need a drug. Yeah, that's all we need. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much.